It is really an express pleasure to introduce today's grand round speaker. My first conversation with Dr. Wolf occurred in 2006 when we decided to form our own palliative care team here at Children's National, and I was completely overwhelmed by all the challenges of creating a new clinical service. Luckily, not only has Dr. Wolf burst the field of pediatric palliative care, but she was also extremely thoughtful, generous, and incredibly helpful when I reached out in a panic with numerous questions. I had the opportunity to work more closely with her when I attended the Palliative Care Education and Practice course in Boston a few years later, which I highly recommend for anybody interested in palliative care. I think it's safe to say that a great deal of how the PANDA team today came to be is a reflection of the influence of Dr. Wolf, both in the guidance she gave to me personally and also in the leadership that she offered to the field of pediatric palliative care, which is a field that she really pioneered. Dr. Wolf originally comes from Montreal and her undergraduate degree was in psychology from McGill University. The rest of her career has really been in Boston and the Harvard system where she attended medical school, did a pediatric residency and a chief residency, a pediatric hematology oncology fellowship, a master's in public health, and fellowships in health services research and medical ethics. It's exhausting just describing it all. Um, Dr. Wolf has been an incredible force in her career to date, and it's almost impossible to describe her impact in just the few minutes that I have. Her groundbreaking research on understanding the symptoms that children with advanced care experience really began the pediatric palliative care movement and has continued to push the field forward. It's allowed us to continue to work harder to reduce suffering for all children with cancer and with really any serious illness. Her clinical palliative care team at Boston has been a model that we and many other center, centers across the country and even across the world have sought to emulate. Her educational leadership, particularly the curriculum that she created in the course that I mentioned in, in Boston, the Palliative Care and Education and Practice course, and also the Education in Palliative End of Life Care, the pediatrics track, um, have influenced scores of pediatric providers across the country and around the world. And her advocacy on behalf of children with life-threatening illness has pushed the medical field and policy leaders to work harder to meet the needs of all children. It is beyond an honor to have Dr. Wolf here to share some of her wisdom with the children's national community. She is a personal role model, a wonderful speaker, and an inspiration to all of us as we strive to offer the best possible care to children and families who are suffering. Thank you. Okay, good morning everyone and thank you for that um, uh, incredible introduction. I, I'll add that uh, nothing happens without teamwork and I have been blessed uh, with working with amazing uh, partners and mentees. I will say that it's been a privilege to have worked together with Pam, for example, and, and many, many others and so um, you know, it's unusual in, in, in childbirth, but like, you know, the field of pediatric palliative care came from a lot of people, not just one mother. So um, uh, it's been, it's been a, a lot of teamwork. In any, way, in any case, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here today um, to share with you some of my thoughts on the integration of palliative care along the life cycle of the seriously <laughs> ill child and family. And, uh, figure out how to advance. I, there we go. I have no, nothing to disclose except, again, uh, that, it's, um, uh, that it's great to be here and that anything I say today comes from a lot of wise minds that have uh, had the privilege to work together with. So, what I'd like to share with you today um, is this concept of integration. To integrate means to combine one thing with another so that they become whole. And that is a fundamental principle of pediatric palliative care. My objectives today are to describe the approach to pediatric palliative care integration early in the care of children with serious illness to explain how pediatric palliative care involves integrated care directed at the physical, emotional, social, and spiritual, spiritual needs of the child and family, 
delivered by an integrated team and at times, at times in collaboration with a specialty pediatric palliative care team. And to evaluate whether pediatric palliative care integration improves outcomes. And throughout this talk, I'm going to share with you Mary's story. Uh, Mary has traveled with me uh, to many of my lectures, and she uh, and her family have uh, given permission for, for us to talk about her in the context of this talk. Um, and I feel like she's sort of uh, right here over my shoulder uh, every time I talk about pediatric palliative care. So when Mary was six years old, she was diagnosed with essential nervous system low-grade glioma. She lived in rural New Hampshire. We were caring for her in Boston with her parents and her eight-year-old sister. She was a very upbeat child and loved school and friends. And so I ask you, uh, in this context, does, does Mary need palliative care? I've seen some nodding. Do you want to, um, I, I'm going to pick on you because you nodded so early on. Do you want to share with me why? So I'll just repeat it in case people didn't hear, but you believe, as do I, that palliative care should be integrated in the care of any child who's seriously ill because it will be life, life transform, it will be a transformative experience. And actually, uh, I do have to admit that palliative care really is the new sexy term for supportive care, right? It just has some definition to supportive care in the context of seriously ill children. So, Let's describe palliative care integration. The World Health Organization defines palliative care as an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problems associated with life-threatening illness through the prevention, prevention, and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable assessment and treatment of pain, and other problems, physical, psychosocial, and spiritual. So of course, in the context of being diagnosed with a brain tumor, you need this kind of care. Everybody needs this kind of care. And as we describe palliative care, it's an approach, it's a philosophy of care. It's not, and this is like the main point of my talk, it is not a phase of care. So we have to let go of this sort of this problem of uh, the child is now receiving palliative care. That doesn't work anymore because it's a very dated concept of what palliative care is. And it also, as you can imagine, sends the unintended message that there's uh, no hope for cure. Palliative care is an approach to care, a philosophy of care. It's an individualized blending of care directed at the underlying illness and the physical, emotional, social, and spiritual needs of the child and family with continuous reevaluation and adjustment. End-of-life care, in my opinion, is a phase of care. And I think we have permission at times to say that a child is receiving end-of-life care. Not everyone who receives an integrated approach to care, a philosophical uh, approach that's consistent with the values of palliative care, reaches end of life, thankfully. End of life care is when we're almost certain that a child is not going to survive. And, it, and that could be moments, for example, when we've made a loving decision together with a family to discontinue a ventilator for a child who's in the ICU. At that time, from the time we choose that discontinuation, that child is facing the end of their life. Sometimes that child even surprises us during that phase and continues to breathe on their own. So we don't know, for example, with absolute certainty that every child we think is gonna die is actually gonna die. And then of course bereavement care 
starts well before end of life because we know from lots of data that what we do before the child dies makes the world a difference in terms of the well-being of the family and community beyond the death of the child. And I'll end by saying what parents have taught us and what we are embracing through this integrated approach is that it's okay to hope for cure, life extension, and a miracle up until the last breath of your child. You do not have to take that away from parents in order for them to get that their child will not survive. And parents have also taught us that they hope for their child's comfort, well-being, and meaning in life at the same time. So there's no, no more either or. That's what we're getting rid of forever, okay? And what is this period of time? What is this period of time? What is the most challenging uh, force that affects families during this period of time? Well, my feeling is, and this is where this sort of philosophy of palliative care takes on a different edge than general supportive care. What this is all about is that it's a, it's a period of uncertainty, okay? If a child has um, an ear infection, there's some uncertainty as to what the outcome will be with the best medical practice. But when a child has a life-threatening serious illness, we're aiming for that child to live as long as possible, hopefully well into adulthood, but we just don't know. And despite all our prognostic capabilities, which are very poor, we can't tell anyone with certainty who, which child with acute lymphoblastic leukemia will be in the 85% and which child will be in the 15%. And when we don't know that, families don't know that, and so no matter how small that chance is that that child won't survive, it's a, a period of huge uncertainty, and we just need to accept that. So when we take care of a child like Mary, the whole way in which we approach care is that it's guided by goals of care. And I'm gonna give you a few ways in which we uncover goals of care in our palliative approach. But, let's just, but in my experience, uh, what happens is that there are three general buckets that families and teens fall into. One bucket, and this is likely to be the approach that we would take with Mary at the very beginning, that we are aiming for Mary to live as long as possible. Leave no stone unturned. There's a bigger bucket, especially when an illness is even more serious, where families are aiming for their child to live as long as possible and as well as possible. And then that end of life care period, is when families hope that their child lives as comfortably as possible. Notice a few things. Uh, it's all about how you're living, okay, in every, with whatever the goal is. And I don't use the word cure. I really, um, this is something that people don't always agree with me and we can have a conversation about this at any point. But I think especially in oncology, we have this paradigm of cure or not. And I get it. I'm an oncologist uh, by training. But the problem is, is that we're, no matter what we do for that particular child, there are other outcomes that are associated with the care of a child with cancer. They're never going to be the same child that they were before they were diagnosed. And if we sort of create a paradigm of Cure is the, is the vocabulary that we emphasize in the care of these patients. We set up expectations really for going back to the way it was before. And I feel that that's a false expectation. But we are aiming that that child live as long as possible, like we hope for ourselves and we hope for our own loved ones, no matter what we face down the road. In any case, so when we're thinking about the palliative approach to a child who is facing a serious illness, 
and they have um, a problem, a symptom, what everything falls out from the goals of care. So once we've identified how we're going to take care of this child, we think of any problem that arises, we always think about what the differential diagnosis is going to be. Say it's a severe pain, always, right? When we assess that child, the way in which we assess may vary with how, what our goals are. So for someone who's in the general bucket is leaving, living as long as possible, that assessment, the treatment, and the follow-up is going to be very intensive. It will involve tests. It will involve um, procedures, anything to meet that goal. Well, when we're in the middle category, we'll always think about what the possibilities are, but our, our assessment may be more targeted, our treatment may be more targeted, but our follow-up will always be intensive. And then in the final uh, type of goal, our assessment may be limited uh, entirely. We may do uh, uh, empiric treatment and be very flexible in how we approach a problem like pain, but our follow-up will always be intensive. And that's the framework that we use. And for Mary, as I described, she is receiving a palliative approach to care based on the goal at six years old of living as long as possible. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. At the time that, of, that Mary was six, uh, we recommended a, a chemotherapy regimen, intensive psychosocial and spiritual support, and her uh, passion was to be in school throughout treatment, which we were able to um, facilitate, and then she completed therapy, which was beautiful. Now, just to note that children who receive pediatric palliative care, and this is specifically around pediatric palliative care consultation, but all the children that we care for with serious illness, many of them live a very long time. And that's, again, to emphasize this point that we're talking about integration throughout the life of this child. In this study, which was led by Chris Futner, this was a study of uh, pediatric palliative care programs in six big programs around the country. And we just looked at whether or not, you know, what happened over the course of a year for the over 500 children who were followed by these uh, six programs. And what you can see is that um, at the end of one year, while about a uh, little over 25% of children had died, 75% survived. Just underscores the long-term approach to these children. Well, Mary required a long-term approach as well. At 16, she developed a pain syndrome that consisted of headaches and back pain. And she had undergone many uh, evaluations. Clearly, it was at the forefront of her mind that she may have relapsed. And yet, you know, several early spine and brain MRIs did not show evidence of tumor recurrence. And then several months later, she presented with quartz compression and paralysis, and at that point, there was documentation, there was evidence on her scan of metastatic spinal disease. Ten years later, it happens, right? She had continued to live with her parents and older sister in rural New Hampshire, and she remained passionate about school, and in that ten-year period, had begun painting. And uh, she had a Monet style of painting, in fact, used a lot of Monet's um, photographs in order to sort of uh, uh, stimulate her painting. And so we uh, used the approach that I'm going to share with you, which is very simple to sort of best understand how to take care of Mary by trying to identify those goals of care. And this is simple. There are only five questions that you need to know. Uh, this is what happens when a palliative care team goes in with a family and you go in and, and you're told by maybe the primary team that they've been a bit upset, a bit angry, they're frustrated with how things are going, and then the palliative care team goes in and somehow something happens in that room and everybody emerges 
hugging each other, okay? And I, I've had many of these experiences. And I've also been on the other side of things. So I'm not suggesting that we're better, but there is an approach that somehow breaks through a family's frustration. And, and this is what I share with you. So we have five questions that we go through uh, systematically uh, when we meet a family. And the first question is not about the disease. The first question, and this should be the case in any encounter that we have for the first time with families. Just tell us about your child. Tell us about yourself if it's an adolescent. Uh, what do you enjoy in life? What's your child like when they're not feeling badly? I mean, it, it just sets the stage for something that is a little bit different from what they're used to and, and establishes that you care for that child and family. You want to know them as a person. And then we ask, what is your understanding of your child's illness? And, and having sort of broken the ice, families are able to share with us what they know is going on. And very often, they know much more than we think they know or that they're willing to speak out loud. But if we sort of break the ice a little bit, and create a safe environment, they're willing to share their sort of deeper thoughts about what they understand. And once we have that understanding, we say, in light of your understanding, what's most important to you? What are you hoping for? And we ask, what are your worries and what are your fears? And we get a lot of information a lot of their willingness to share what's really on their mind. And then a question that um, we've integrated from our chaplaincy services, which I think is, is really important, is in times of difficulty, where do you find your strength? And as Mary Robinson, our, our, the head of chaplaincy services that our program has said to me, you also have to follow up and ask, and how well is that working for you right now? Because there may be an important um, crisis that's going on existentially for a family in these difficult times. And so once we go through this conversation, the most important thing to do at the end is to say, so what I understand, based on what we've, we've just been talking about, what I understand is that for Mary, you're hoping that she lives as long and as well as possible. I usually just frame it in one of those categories. And there are times as a palliative care service, I will hear from a family, so what I understand is that for Mary, you want to leave no stone unturned and that you're, you're hoping that she lives as long as possible. And sometimes it's, so what I understand is that given the stage of Mary's illness, what we're all hoping together is that she lives as comfortably as possible. And that's really an important ending to this conversation and it establishes the goals of care. So as I noted, uh, this was Mary's family's approach to live as long as possible and as well as possible with continued cancer-directed therapy, but no hair loss, okay? The preferred location of care was home and school, symptoms to be managed proactively, and of course, for Mary to continue painting. Now, a note about disease-directed therapy, and this is sort of an area of complexity in the care of children with cancer, but this applies to lots of different illness paradigms. As I've noted, there are some uh, really uh, helpful data that um, tell us from the voices of parents, like Myra Blubon Langner's study, which was done both in the UK and the US, that parents often want to leave no stone unturned and do not see cancer-directed therapy and symptom-directed care as mutually exclusive alternative approaches, okay? Pam Hines, this study is one of my absolute favorites, and her colleagues did uh, such an impressive study of talking directly to children themselves, and, and so does Maureen in her work. 
Um, and that's very courageous uh, and hard uh, to really get their voices involved in these conversations. And, and, and they identified that a key factor affecting children's decisions regarding continued cancer-directed therapy at end of life is thinking about my relationships with others. Now, what does that mean? Some people worry that children are doing it for their parents, and that's why they want continued cancer-directed therapy. And we, we worry a lot about that sort of tension between parents and children and who are we treating, who's our patient anyway. That comes up all the time. I take it a little bit differently. I see children existing in the context of their families, and that family wholeness is as important to the child as it is to the parent, and that it's okay so long as we're attending to all the other elements of care for a child to be willing to try a cancer-directed therapy because it's what their parents wish for, and we could talk about that a lot as well. And I have a little bit of data from my own work that kind of underscores that. We, and I'll tell you a little bit about this study, did a study where we had children report themselves on their symptoms and quality of life. And then uh, we looked at that in this particular analysis at end of life, so these were, these were amongst the cohort of kids that just filled out those surveys in the last 12 weeks of life. And we looked at their psychological well-being and what was going on for them from a cancer-directed therapy perspective. And what we found is an association, which is just an exploratory opportunity for future research, that children who had continued mild cancer-directed therapy at end of life had higher psychological well-being scores. So perhaps there's their own benefit, especially in adolescence, for knowing that they're continuing to try something. So we have to sort of get away from, in my opinion, the fight over whether or not to continue cancer-directed therapy. Let's let go of that and let's embrace the whole child. So getting to embracing the whole child, um, this is Eric Cassell, who often looks like a mad scientist, in my opinion. <laughs> He has been um, a writer of these concepts for many, many years, and one of his most impressive books was The Nature of Suffering, which he wrote in 1986. And he says, suffering is a specific state of distress that occurs when the intactness or integrity of the person is threatened or disrupted. It lasts until the threat is gone or integrity is restored. And the meanings and the fear are personal and individual, so that even if two patients have the same symptoms, their suffering would be different, right? Suffering is hard to measure because it is interpreted, it's experienced through the lens of the patient. And so it's even more complicated in pediatric when we have patients who can't express themselves. So we've taken um, Eric's uh, frame and have used that, uh, had taken his words and used that as to, to develop a framework for our research program. So if we think about integrity in pediatrics, we think about the integrity of the family, which involves the parents, the siblings, and the patient. You'll see that word in a second. The, the animation's a little off. And then there's a life-threatening illness, a serious illness, and what happens is that, you know, using Eric's words, there are visible threats, like the diagnosis of the cancer or cystic fibrosis, and some of the physical symptoms that we can see very clearly. And then there are all these invisible threats to the integrity of that family. Of course, the disruptions from normal life, emotional symptoms that we don't always a listed existential concerns and sociodemographic concerns. And that causes family suffering. So it's our job to use targeted interventions like intensive symptom treatment approaches and global interventions 
And communication, by the way, is one of the most important interventions in easing suffering. Screening, resilience training, sometimes a palliative care consultation, those are the interventions that are more global. And the idea is to restore that family's integrity. It will never be the same, but we want to make them whole again as a family. So, um, as I mentioned, sort of to try and chip away at some of these aspects of this framework, we've been doing some research to sort of see how children's experiences are reflected in this framework. And one study, again, is the PDQuest study. Um, and this is where children themselves reported on their quality of life when they had advanced cancer. And when I say advanced cancer in this study, it was simply cancer that had advanced beyond initial treatment. So um, beyond initial treatment meant the first relapse of uh, leukemia or uh, a solid tumor that had recurred. So these are not children at that other end of the spectrum. And what you can see here is using a standardized instrument, the PQL, about uh, almost 40% of kids had a poor or fair quality of life. And this is uh, based on reports of over 900 um, PDQuest administrations amongst over 100 children in three different centers. Their physical quality of life, remember the the domain that we can sometimes see a little bit more uh, was even higher. And I think this is really interesting when it comes to school, uh, which is really the work of childhood where children need to be, their quality of life was fairly poor as well. And the question is, you know, what drives quality of life um, in pediatric oncology? And the factor that we found to be most important, most closely associated with quality of life outcomes are those symptoms that we were talking about. So this is um, an analysis that was done by Abby Rosenberg, who's one of uh, my mentees. And uh, she looked at quality of life scores and how different distressing symptoms impacted on those scores going up and down. And of course, all these different types of symptoms um, that made up, um, this is using the memorial uh, symptom assessment scale, which is developmentally adapted, uh, were associated with uh, distress from symptoms were associated with de decrease, decreases in quality of life. And this is the report of the children themselves with regard to the symptoms and the distress that they were experiencing from those symptoms, with pain and fatigue being the most commonly reported symptoms by children themselves. Uh, resulting in a high degree of distress. And these are the reports from the smaller group uh, in the last 12 weeks of life where those symptoms worsen even more so. And then you have some of the psychological symptoms. And I find this issue around irritability something that we need to uh, continue to focus on. This is um, from uh, another, the cohort study that I had mentioned earlier, looking at symptoms in children with non-cancer diagnosis. And again, the full array of symptoms that we could think about affect these children as well. And as we know full well, that children with all kinds of serious illness are high, uh, um, use technology to live well. I, I reframed highly dependent on, um, just so that you know, uh, with a majority benefiting from a feeding tube uh, but a high proportion uh, with tracheostomy, other forms of ventilation, and um, ventilation support in place as well. And this is um, uh, an illustration that could only be created by the one and only Chris Futner, um, which shows you the drugs received by patients receiving palliative care, the larger circles like acetaminophen, these are the symptom-relieving medications, are the more common ones. The darker ones are used closer to end of life, like morphine. And these are the connections, in other words, the poly, representing the polypharmacy that's sometimes helpful to these patients in order to ease their suffering. And this is Mary's 
um, this is how we approached Mary's symptom distress, especially as her illness continued to progress. She continued on cancer-directed therapy. Uh, she had a very severe pain syndrome, as I mentioned, and required um, a very uh, integrated approach. Um, oh, something happened here. Uh, she, there, we, we used methylphenidate for her fatigue, her GI distress, anxiety, difficulty sleeping, and of course, integrated massage, Reiki prayer, also that she could continue painting. All right, going on to the second objective, to explain how palliative care involves the in integrated care directed at all these domains, um, a little bit more uh, emphasis on this various domains. So, Let's take the invisible domains that we were talking about, and this is social suffering. One of my mentees, Kira Bona, has focused her work on household material hardship, that is, food insecurity, energy insecurity, and housing insecurity. And she identified that when families come into care, in the care of a pediatric oncology team, at diagnosis, 20% of those families have HMH. At six months, 30% of those families have HMH. That is, they may not be able to put food on the table, the most common form of insecurity at six months for a child who's been treated for cancer at an institution with robust resources and psychosocial support. Okay, we're, it's not that we're not trying, but there's more that we need to do. And what's fascinating about Kira's work, and I hope she comes here to speak soon, is that she has also demonstrated the association between poverty and worse ALL outcomes. So this is not just about well-being, it's also about living longer. And so what we need is an integrated approach, resource specialists and psychosocial clinicians to hold the family and uh, serve their social needs. And this is work by Abby Rosenberg again, uh, using some of our data from the perspective of parents of children with advanced cancer and their distress levels, which are quite high, and what she identified is the factors that are associated with their distress are financial hardship and seeing their child suffering a lot. And importantly, that distress goes down when a communication approach allows them to have goals aligned with prognostic understanding. Remember I said communication is an intervention. And so to ease that distress, again, we need to work as a team with resource specialists and psychosocial clinicians. And Abby also did an analysis of our bereaved sibling cohort and what she found is that, and this is post-death, that a year after a child dies, uh, siblings report high anxiety and depression levels. And importantly, unfortunately, those are associated with risky behaviors, using illicit drugs, drinking alcohol regularly. And so we know that in collaboration with our general pediatric colleagues, that this is a period of vulnerability, also in need of a palliative approach. And this is again work by Chris Futner's group uh, looking at spiritual suffering. In this study, of course, we know this very well, most parents of children receiving pediatric palliative care feel that religion, spirituality, or life philosophy is important in helping them deal with tough times, and yet there are existential crises difficulties um, that uh, lead to feelings of rejecting that source of support. And so, of course, we need chaplains involved in the team as well. And just a note about primary versus subspecialty palliative care here. Primary palliative care is what we all do every day when we take care of seriously ill patients on the wards as residents and nurses at the bedside and in the ICU. And we need to ensure that all of us as clinicians in that setting have the qualifications and the knowledge, skills, and behaviors to be able to deliver that on the front line. And then we are a subspecialty now of palliative care subspecialists, 
And it's our mandate to get involved in more complicated situations clinically, but also to move the field forward together with our colleagues. And so this is Mary's interdisciplinary team. Um, and I will tell you, it definitely took a village to take care of Mary, especially as her um, disease progressed with her primary palliative care team, our subspecialty palliative care team got involved as well. And Mary ended up uh, spending her final days in the hospital. And the reason for that was that because of her location of rural New Hampshire and the intensity of her symptom support, she could not um, actually transition to the community uh, because that we, weren't, we weren't able to mobilize the resources where she was living. But her, she, she spent her final days in some, and we have a few of these rooms called Comfort Corners, and her mother, Wanda, said, to me, the Comfort Corner was beyond words in our last days with Mary. To have the safety of the hospital, the doctors, nurses, all caregivers, and father and me, and for all of us to be with her until the end was the ultimate blessing, and of course, her community was able to come down to her. So does all of this make a difference, okay? It sounds good, it sounds like the right thing to do, but the question is, does integrated care actually make a difference? Well, we're trying to uncover the data, okay? We're trying to look at this empirically and we still have a ways to go, but I'll share with you some data uh, that's emerging. And one is sort of thinking about that PDQuest study. So who has kids? And when they come home from school and you say, how was your day, what do they say? Fine. <laughs> and when these children come to your office and you ask them how they're feeling, they often say fine as well. Children are not necessarily very eloquent in sharing how they're feeling. But often, they're feeling very deep deep feelings inside. I'm depressed, lonely, scared, dying, lost. And so the point of the PDQuest study was to amplify the voice of the child, in particular when it came to them sharing how they were feeling physically and psychologically. And what we used was a tablet computer, and every time these children came to clinic, they a random sample of them completed PDQuest, and that data was then fed back to their families and to their clinical teams. And then the control group simply completed the surveys and we saved their data. And then we compared outcomes between those children who, whose families and providers received feedback and those children who simply didn't get any feedback. And, and this is a primary palliative care intervention, right? It's not intended to have a palliative care team involved, but the question was, did the primary oncology team having that data do a better job taking care of these children? What do you think? Somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the outcomes of this study, showing that fortunately, all the scores changed in the direction that we would hope, so they're uh, symptom distress scores went down, their quality of life scores went up, and then we had this overall well-being score, and their sort of rating of how sick they felt went down. However, only certain uh, sub-cohorts uh, uh, met statistical significance. So there was no significant change in symptom scores, however, amongst uh, older children and children who went on to be longer-term survivors, those are the kids where they benefited most from the feedback. If you think back to that cohort of children who did not survive and their symptom scores got worse over time, we're still not doing a good enough job amongst them in terms of attending to their distress. But what this study taught us is that there's a, a signal suggesting that if we amplify the child's voice through these methods, that there is some effect on how people take care of them. And there's other data showing that it was very, uh, very, very much accepted by families. And in fact, one of the most meaningful 
findings was that when we asked parents how much, whether or not they thought the PDQuest intervention was valuable, 95% said it helped me to understand how my child was feeling because we just don't know in these situations. And that's, that's a gift in and of itself. Now, I hope you're all aware of some of the studies in the adult world, and this is a palliative care intervention looking at subspecialty palliative care, but Jennifer Temmel and her colleagues published in the New England Journal of Medicine the study that showed that not only did a palliative care consult service improve depression scores and quality of life scores in, in patients with metastatic lung cancer, uh, but healthcare utilization went down and of course, very importantly, those patients survived longer. And why is that? We know that suffering drains energy. We often see that when we stop manipulating children, they actually do better, that they actually live longer and feel better, that if we take it down a notch, we might actually improve the outcome of the care of these children. We just dial it down a little bit. We don't have randomized control studies in pediatrics. Um, we did a before and after study looking at parent report of child suffering amongst children with cancer before we had a palliative care service and after we had a palliative care service. And we showed some decrease in, in reports of suffering from the parent perspective with regard to pain and dyspnea and a trend in anxiety, we didn't touch fatigue, which we can talk about. Another interesting finding was that when we began the, the PAC services, as we call our palliative care service, the number of children dying in the intensive care unit dropped dramatically. And other outcomes associated with this were decreases in um, longer stay with, hosp with hospice earlier decisions around resuscitation status. So there's something, maybe a secular trend, or maybe the effect of a palliative care service that's changing the patterns of care for these children. And then there are emerging data, again, uh, showing that children receiving palliative care consultation in the context of oncology have more fun and have experiences that lead, that add meaning to life. And those families receiving palliative care compared to those who don't report improved communication, and children receiving palliative care have shorter hospitalizations and fewer emergency department visits. So we're starting to collect um, the evidence to suggest that either a primary palliative care approach and together with perhaps a subspecialty approach changes the experience of these children and their families. And maybe, maybe, though we don't have the data, maybe even improve the length of their life. So I want to close um, by sharing with you um, something else that Mary gave us as a gift. So she was passionate, as you see, about painting, and she was passionate, passionate about school and teaching and giving back. And she and her family consented to an autopsy. And the pathologist who did her autopsy, Hannah Kinney, um, takes her job very seriously. She had never met Mary, but she read through her medical record with, with, you know, from cover to cover as she was evaluating her brain. And she's also a poet. And Mary's story inspired her to write a poem that I want to share with you right now. So it's called In Honor of Mary. What does courage look like under the microscope? I want to know. Me, the disease detective who entrusts in the power of the microscope to reveal the truth. Here are sections of tumor deep in the eye's pathways that transmit the faces we love. Here is tumor deep in the hypothalamus that generates the daily rhythms of vitality. Here is tumor destroying the spinal cord beyond recognition, no chance ever to run again. But looking down the microscope, I see the young woman who refused 
to sit in a wheelchair at the special class picture as she was losing strength in both legs forever. I see the young woman who painted pink tipped flowers on brilliant blue water with a background of life's greenery just before dying. The pathologist, pathologist's job is to integrate the microscopic findings with the clinical history. Looking down the microscope, the devastation of the spinal cord correlates with the joyful spirit of the doomed woman to stand anyway, and I see courage. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. That was a wonderful, wonderful lecture and a very important message. I wonder if you could uh, speak a little further about uh, what we know about the effect of palliative care on the families. We know that um, when you have chronic illnesses and they last for a year or two, it leads to divorce, it leads to all sorts of havoc uh, to the family, to the siblings. Um, have there been studies done looking at the effect of palliative care on mitigating those uh, outcomes? Um, I have a feeling that every question is going to inspire me to inspire you to, to become an investigator in this field. Uh, there's so many important questions to, to answer about that. And I will say one thing, and this is some work that um, uh, a lot of people are doing, and I know the work especially of Abby Rosenberg, because what we want to uncover, right, is some families um, are destroyed by the experience in various different ways, and some families are resilient. And we want to be able to package, you know, take that resilience and figure what, out what it is and give it to other families who don't come by it as naturally. And so what her work is focusing on is sort of finding and building resilience in families as they enter into the cancer experience, focusing on both the child and the parents with the hope and hypothesis that they will emerge stronger. And there are some, you know, sort of uh, a very it, 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 uh, basic tools, for example, that people have used, especially in the psychosocial oncology arena, helping, helping pa parents with problem solving, right? So if you don't have that skill to begin with, as an example, you chaos emerges. But if you try and teach skills early on in the course, we may see different outcomes much more long-term. And so what we do early on, I think, as we embrace these families is really important. And there's lots of work going on in that arena. I'll say one other thing, though, that the data about uh, divorces is a bit, our perception of that is a bit skewed, and that there was one study, and I'm not up on the literature a while back, that showed actually a majority of families stayed intact uh, as they emerged from um, the loss of any kind of child, any kind of loss from any illness. And um, I think that because sometimes, and we know, again, from other people's work, that this can be uh, a place where families find connection and growth. And uh, it's those who don't that we need to sort of figure out how to better support. Oh, wonderful grand rounds. Thank you. Just just extraordinary lecture. Congratulations. You know, it, it's for obvious reasons, uh, this area has its origins in, in, in uh, pediatric oncology, and I'm sort of interested in your experience um, moving beyond that to mm -hmm. non-oncologic, uh, you know, heart disease, a pulmonary disease. How have these principles been uh, expanded, applied, and received in those settings? Yeah. So I think that, again, from an uh, outcome perspective, I don't think we have a lot of data in terms of the effect of palliative care integration into other not, um, serious childhood illnesses. Um, however, I will tell you that that is um, increasingly um, an opportunity for palliative care services as, as programs grow. So in our setting, um, we are a 400-bed hospital and a full 30% of the patients that we care for in the palliative care service, wait, that might be an exaggeration, 20% uh, have advanced heart disease. 30% um, have cancer. Um, uh, about 10% have uh, pulmonary illnesses. 
and then 50% um, have advanced neurological conditions from the neonatal, uh, perinatal period on through adulthood. And so I think that we, again, through cohort studies, which is a, one of the studies that I'm working on now with Chris Futner, we're going to be able to see whether or not this palliative care integration makes a difference. And again, bringing in investigators, which I know are here too, um, in different settings to be able to look at outcomes. So some of my mentees are, are in the ICU, as I know, I don't know if Tess is here, but uh, oh, traveling, but she's doing some wonderful work in that arena as well. I think, again, we're a new field, uh, but all of those questions need to be addressed. And, and we can't assume that we're making a difference, right? That's, that's the wrong way to go about it. I think we have time for one more question. Is there one over here? My question was actually more, was sort of related to that. Sorry, I'm Shadia Mulesi, I'm pulmonologist, and I was wondering about cystic fibrosis, thinking yes. maybe you guys had worked with um, your CF group, uh, specifically because CF, uh, palliative care in CF is usually related to end of life yeah. care. And so how do you introduce that concept? At, as you mentioned, at the time of diagnosis without uh, without getting the parents or the family um, uh, maybe excited or to um, yeah. feel like, the, you know, are you telling me that, you know, this is um, a life the shortening end? disease? Exactly. So I think we have to be um, very clear and expert in our communication with families around all different types of illnesses. There, there. I don't know how it works in terms of the pulmonologist speaking to families at the time of diagnosis, uh, but I, 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 I think that even with, within each of these fields, the, the subspecialists themselves have to sort of figure out the right paradigm for being able to make, to communicate um, and emphasize different outcomes at different phases of the illness. Just as a note, again, from a subspecialty perspective, we don't, and I don't ever intend to meet children with cystic fibrosis at the time of diagnosis, it's just not necessary. Uh, we add that extra layer of support. Often we're involved in, in families who are facing decisions around transplantation, and that's, that's the time from a subspecialty perspective that we get involved. But I agree that there's a communication sort of trajectory that we need to think about for all of these families. Thank you very much.